Welcome to the fourth episode of Skip Pass. Um, I am actually really excited today because we have got our first guest, um, and not only just someone that's really clever, but also someone who's actually a good friend of mine. Hello. Hi, Ross, or should I rather say Professor Ross Tucker? No. Why? Because <laughs> these, these academic titles don't have much weight in this world. So. Um, I think we probably met about, about five or six years ago. Uh, um, more than that, I reckon, like 10. It's that long ago? Are we that mm. old? Um, yeah. and, but then you were giving a talk at an event that I went to and I was standing in front of you in the food line and they were like having pasta and I didn't want to dish up any pasta because I thought you were part of the Tim Noakes um, whole banting situation. And then I ended up only eating salad, which is horrible. Um, and you know that I don't necessarily have the best um, eating habits because when we go out, we have burgers and beers or margaritas and nachos so um, but anyway the first time we spoke I actually argued with you and then I very quickly realized that arguing with you is not really going to help and I should rather just make you a friend mm -hmm. so all these years later thank you for your patience and still being my friend because most of what I know about rugby I actually learned from you I'm not sure that's true but <laughs> I will say what you know about Oscar Pistorius he learned from me because that was the argument that was <laughs> and look how that ended Oh, yeah, but that was not the argument we had. Anyway, <laughs> I know that you work for World Rugby, yeah. and I actually only really pretend that I know what you actually do for World Rugby. So maybe can you tell me and everyone else again? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a sports scientist, and I finished in 2006 with a PhD, and then I worked in sports business and at the university for a while doing like boring lecturing nonsense. That's where the professor thing comes from. But then in 2015, I left that, thank goodness, and took up a position <laughs> as a consultant with World Rugby. And I don't really have a title other than researcher. Um, so World Rugby's big issue now, and that's the subject of tonight, I guess, is injury and safety in the sport. And so that requires that a lot of research be done. And so my job is to manage and conduct the research into injuries for rugby. And then we'll talk about how the decisions get made, but World Rugby obviously makes the laws yeah. and controls the global game. So where there are issues around player safety and there's something that can be done law-wise, World Rugby does that based on the evidence that I'm supposed to provide to them. So you basically provide the evidence and you see how it impacts on the game. It gets trialled and how it impacts and then you create that, get all that data and then... Yeah, so, so like it starts with problem definition, right? Yeah. So what's the problem, okay? What injuries are we dealing with? Concussion mostly other injuries also, how do they happen, how do you prevent them, do things to prevent them, check whether they're working. Uh, so okay. it's just a constant process of uh, assess, intervene, evaluate, assess, intervene, evaluate. And that's a, I mean, that's a scientific experiment that's mm. ongoing basically, mm. yeah. Um, and the latest things that you've been doing, I think, was mostly into head and neck injuries and concussions. And that's a very big concern for world rugby at the moment. But I think it's also a very big concern for fans. Because as a fan, I get really confused with all the laws that keeps getting changed. Yeah. And I think that's also causing a very big inconsistency with the refereeing. Because I don't even know the refs really, I don't think the refs really know all the rules that well, or it seems like it. Either refs are just really bad or they don't really know. But as a fan, I'm getting quite concerned that like, rugby's just going to get boring. I want to watch rugby where they tackle each other and where they run into each other. And you guys just want to make it like they run around like football players. Yeah, so, so there's a lot in what you just said. <laughs> Number one is referee inconsistency is a big deal, but that's not because they don't understand it. It's because like a referee has to assess a situation, even if it's a simple one, like a one-on-one -on -one tackle, mm. he's dealing with quite a complex situation because the ball carrier is doing one of half a dozen things and so is the tackler and he has to make a decision very quickly based on what he sees. And one of the problems the refs have is that they don't, no one has ever tried to structure the decision-making process. So, But why? I don't know. Like, I think it's partly because the people who make those decisions think they already know how to make them. Oh. Uh, and this happens a lot. So we'll get onto the story about head injuries a little later. But if you asked 100 doctors, is a player concussed, yes or no? Most doctors will say, we know it when we see it, mm -hmm. but they'll be f split 50-50. So how's that? 
how is it possible that you can know something and then still disagree 50-50? Mm. I mean, 50-50 is so bad that you might as well offer a dog a choice of a biscuit and a bone. Like, that's how bad it is. Yeah. Now, if a referee sees a decision and, and they're 50-50 on it, then clearly they don't understand what they're actually deciding, but yeah. they're convinced that they do. So until the sport gives them criteria and definition. So when Angus Gardner sees a shoulder charge, own Farrell on Esterhazen in November last year. Yeah. He gets that wrong because he doesn't have a definition of a shoulder charge. Like, what is a shoulder charge? What does it look like? Mm. As opposed to just he didn't try and wrap his arms. But then I'll say, well, what does it look like to try and wrap your arms? What, what do I see that makes me say, that's a shoulder charge, that's a tackle? That's never been provided. So but in, until that's provided, the, the referees will continue to make mistakes because... They're not guessing, but they're just working without a template. But in this professional sport, how is it possible that there hasn't some, been something like that, especially with the head and neck injuries getting so much more and happening so much more often yeah, than so it's over the last couple of years? That's a historical artifact, I think, of how the law evolves and who owns the law, i.e. the referees, and how they want to interpret it. Yeah. So like two refs, Rasta Rasevenga and Angus Gardner, and Paper and Nigel Owens will all have their yep. own systems. But no one has ever tried, and we, we're trying to do that now. Oh, so in the okay. next few weeks, hopefully okay. something will be announced that guides at least the high tackle decision making process. Okay, so we'll it's see. going somewhere. And then as for, the, as for World Rugby winning the game, like that happens a lot because people say, oh, I let the boys play, and they want to see big hits. I'd argue that if you watched Six Nations games, or even super rugby matches, the hits now are bigger than ever. Yeah. So, so this thing of like, we're, we're taking away the hits and having them run around playing touch rugby seems to me to be completely divorced from reality. There have never been as many injury-induced retirements as there are per year right now. Every single year, most recently Lambie, retires because of injuries caused by the physicality of the game. There are dozens of players in England I can think of half a dozen from New Zealand, a few from South Africa, where they're retiring. And that's not a soft sport. Mm. And but you aren't, you not, aren't you trying to, to change that now with the new laws that are coming into play? Yeah, so you're trying to make it safer. But safer doesn't mean softer. Those two oh. things are not necessarily synonyms for one another. And one of the, like rugby's in the middle at the moment of quite a big tension because it, it, it's the, the way it used to be and we're in the middle of change and people are naturally resistant to change yeah. and it causes some issues. So when a player gets sent off the field because of a directive from World Rugby to try and make it safer, then there's an outcry and he says, oh, it's gone soft and what's happened to the game we love and all this sort of nonsense. In my opinion, if you don't change that, the game is heading for extinction because... Parents the, are not going to want to have their kids play rugby right. anymore. So yeah. many of the lessons that we know about rugby safety come from the NFL, where in the 90s and, and early 2000s, this problem was identified. The league tried to cover up the risks. They tried to downplay mm -hmm. head injury, concussion risks, and so forth. And eventually they got slapped with a massive lawsuit, oh. which is now at about a billion dollars that they're paying out to all these players who oh were injured goodness. playing the sport. The numbers of participants in school football and what they call peewee football and so on is way down. Oh, really? Uh, and there are concerns that rugby will go the same way. So, so I'm not trying to be overly dramatic, but if, if, uh, if rugby doesn't get a handle on the perception of risk, then the participation numbers will continue to decline steadily, and then we will be in a situation where there is less rugby to see. So even just a practical thing, in the U.S., there's only one company, as far as I know, that will now give insurance to teams and players because the risks are deemed so high so that high. they're uninsurable. By the time that happens in rugby, the sport becomes almost financially untenable because it becomes so dangerous and so financially uncoverable mm. that no one would cover them. And then why would you take the chance of playing? So, so World Rugby has to intervene. We have to do something to change that risk. And that's where law change and all these things are happening. And my research is meant to support doing it. But how are you going to keep fans to, or to keep watching the game? Because they're like die-hard fans. If you look at the numbers going down, people watching rugby, they just don't do that anymore. So what's World Rugby going to do around that? Is that why they're introducing the Nations well, Cup or in these things? 
to just change it up a bit and make it more exciting for people to watch? Or I, No, I think those two things exist separate from one another. So there is a commercial challenge that rugby faces yeah. at the moment, especially in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. And I think that's largely been driven especially by how rugby, dominant yeah. New Zealand teams are. Okay. Because Super Rugby as a formula is a disaster. Yeah. Like no one really knows what's happening in the tournament. Like who's winning it? Because yeah. there's all these conferences and it's interconference, and you can be this, the third best team in, in New Zealand but, and you're third on the log, but you're only okay. seventh because yeah. the way, anyways. But it's kind of like there's a pattern to it. It's everyone plays and no one really knows what's going on. And by the time we get to June, July, three New Zealand teams make the last four. Okay, cool. And it's the same with the rugby championships. Is the, 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 form, the tournament is stodgy because... New Zealand will beat Argentina twice, uh, yeah. sorry, Australia twice. Yeah. We might win one, lose one. And by the time we go to New Zealand, the tournament's it's basically over. over. So that's the point, yeah. So I see the fixtures came out today and it's different this year, so maybe that'll shake it up. In the north, if you look at Six Nations and Premiership and so on, it's actually very healthy. So there's a commercial challenge for rugby at the moment where trying to globalize the sport is, is a big deal. Um, They've tried to get global season and so forth mm. because of, anyway, that, that's failed. But the, to answer your question, will we lose certain people who just want to see people smash one another? Probably, yeah, but I don't really care because we're going to lose someone either way. Yeah. We're going to lose the marginal fan who's worried about safety, the mother of a seven-year-old who says actually maybe you should play field hockey or mm. tennis or golf. And the, and the family and potentially You'd anyone stop watching. who'll stop. So you, you've got to choose. Who do you yeah. want to lose, you know? Yeah. And I'm not, I don't, these are not gladiators in a Roman amphitheater, like killing each other. It's I guess, stupid. I guess the counter argument to that is the game is also going to get much faster because there's actually going to be more running um, and more attacking than just big hits. So I guess from that point of view, if, also if what happens, if... If some of these laws do get changed, like the laws that the World Rugby is proposing now is that the 50-22 rule, yeah. um, where if, you, if the attacking team kicks out of their half and it bounces into touch in the opposition's 22, then they're getting the line out. Um, so that also outlawing the two-man tackle, which I think is going to be very difficult because now you're going to have no, to start looking one, around. One, I don't yeah. think that will happen. Mm -hmm. And then also there's another one where you can actually review a yellow card while the guy's in the sin bin. Yeah, it's mandatory. Um, yeah, military. so that's for that. But I think the biggest one is obviously lowering the height of the tackle. Yeah, so um, yeah, so all these law changes are intended to do the same thing, and that's reduce risk. Yeah. So, but so, the fifty twenty two rule, do you think that's just so people run more and that there's more attacking, and then the pe players actually just get a bit more fatigued and the big hits won't happen? Or? No, the the main reason for that is in twenty fifteen sixteen, I did a I led a study. There was a number of people involved which try to understand how do concussions happen. Because if you want to solve the problem, you have to understand what causes the problem. Makes sense. So the first thing you say is, right, can we identify risk factors? Like what, what set of behaviors and what circumstances are most likely to injure players? And what we found is that it's the tackle. That's yeah. not massively surprising. What is maybe a little bit more surprising is that it's the tackler. That was not that, when I was reading your research article, I think that was yeah. the biggest... So, like most interesting thing that I've read. So yeah. within a tackle, the tackler is three times more likely to have a concussion than the ball carrier. So that's really important because if you think about the law around high tackles, like what are they doing? They're trying to protect the ball carrier. Yeah. As in, if you've got a ball, I can't put my shoulder into your head and that's yeah. for your protection. So how do you, now that you know that I'm actually the one who's more in danger, how do you design something to protect me from myself? Right? So there's a, there's a number of different analogies there. One would be, if I'm driving at 120k an hour in, an, in a suburb with a speed limit 60, who's in danger? Obviously the pedestrians, yeah. but actually I am also. So speed limits protect both people. And our thinking is that height limits on the tackle protect both players. So at the so moment the high tackle is nipple height, so you want to lower it well, to no, waist or the shoulder. It's shoulder, yeah. So anything over the shoulder onto the head or neck. So you want to lower tackle. it to waistline? No, or? we no, we don't want to lower it. We are exploring whether it should be lowered to either the armpit. Okay. And the French have proposed waistline. Now, in France they've got their own particular set of problems because last year four Forward. young guys died yeah. playing rugby and so they're under 
understandable pressure to try and reduce the risk by lowering, well, doing something. Yeah. And their suggestion is let's bring the height all the way down. But I'm, doesn't I'm not that cause other problems again, like your the head hitting the bony like hips and things? Yeah. So that causes yeah. that causes a lot of concussions. But yeah. If you want to manage. If you want to manage overall risk, you don't ask where the thing happens more. You ask where it happens more likely. Okay. There's a difference between those two things, right? So, for instance, if I was to say to you that in 2015, 12 people died taking selfies, right, which is true, apparently, and five people were killed by sharks. So you've got 12 selfies, five sharks. Therefore, selfies are more dangerous than sharks. No. That's a stupid way to think. Yeah. Why? Because every day six billion selfies get taken. Like half of them are Kardashians and Oaks doing CrossFit. <laughs> and the other half is just normal people for Instagram. Whereas every day, how many people... Instagram model. Are you on Instagram? You're yeah. not on Instagram anymore. Yeah, I left that world. Why? Just... I tried to tag you the other day and it's I couldn't. A waste of energy. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, so, so it's 12 people die taking selfies, but that's out of billions. Yeah. Whereas okay. five people are killed by sharks, that's out of thousands. So relatively speaking, sharks are much more dangerous than selfies. Same thing, more people die in car accidents than motorbikes, but motorbikes are more dangerous because mm -hmm. there are so, so few of them compared to cars. So you have to correct for what's called exposure, right? Mm -mm. So without wanting to get too technical, when we look at the risk of a concussion, there are more concussions caused by a head to a hip, but that's because there's so many more tackles there. Okay. When the players are upright and when the heads are in contact, that's where the most danger exists. So in trying to change overall risk, you have to ask, can we substitute high for low, low for high? Mm. High risk is head to head. Low risk is head to torso, head to upper leg. So we would far rather every tackle happen here than up there. And that's for both players. Does that make sense? Like, mm, mm, mm. So, so, yeah. so, so what happened was we gathered this data from literally 5,000 odd tackles. It's a big project that gets done. When did you start doing this research? Uh, middle of 2015. Oh, wow, Ended okay. middle of 2016. And then what happened is, because now I'm, I'm a scientist and people I work with are medical doctors and whatever. We're not, we're not there to solve the problem. We can describe the problem yeah. and then experts must come and tell us what to and do And the about coaches it. and the... Yeah, so we formed a working group and Eddie Jones was on it, Paul O'Connell, uh, Gus Pichot, John Jeffrey, so they're British and Irish Lions, Argentina guy, Elaine Roland is the referee manager, a couple of other players, it was a Sophie Spence from women's rugby and so forth. And we say, right, here's the picture. Th this stuff over here is high risk, this stuff over here is low risk. Now you guys, as experts, tell us how do we How go we from here it? to there? And they made a number of suggestions. What were their suggestions? So, so if we think of the risk factors, the speed of the player is a risk factor. The faster the tackler goes, the more danger. That's yeah. obvious. Yeah. Acceleration, if he accelerates, more danger. His height, in other words, if he's upright as opposed to bent, more danger. If there's head-to-head -head contact, it's much more dangerous than head-to-leg, head-to-knee, head-to-hip, head-to-torso. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the direction of t front on, much more dangerous than side or back, obviously. Yeah. And the final one was the type of tackle. So an active shoulder tackle as opposed to a passive shoulder tackle or an arm tackle. So those are obvious ones, right? Yeah. So now you say to the coach, right, given those six factors, can we shift them from right to left, from high to low? And they say, okay, look, you're not going to change active shoulder tackles. The coach wants to dominate. Yeah. You're not going to change the direction. You yeah. can't ask players to say, come Can past me and I'll tackle yes. you from the side. That's yeah. ridiculous. And they said, right, the low-hanging fruit, the thing you deal with first is the height. And specifically, what you're trying to avoid is two heads sharing airspace. Yeah. So how do you do that? Well, you make the tackler go lower. Right? And then related to that is the tackler's body position. If the tackler's upright, which is to say, I'm tackling you, presenting my chest to you like this. Yeah. That's more risky than if I'm presenting the top of my shoulder. So it's the same concept as you want the tackler lower and bent. Mm. So that was where, so those two things, okay, so those, that was the low-hanging fruit. Then the, the question about what else we might do in the future was the speed and the acceleration. So then you ask, okay, but how can how we you... take the speed out of the tackle? Yeah. And that's where the 50-22 comes in. So 
if we can park that, yeah. that's so. So the fifty twenty two, the laws around the rack and so forth. Those are those are designed to potentially take speed out of contact. I'll tell you how that would work in a moment. Because okay. you've got to think laterally there. Yeah. Whereas the height thing is a more direct, obvious thing. And it's, it's like also, I guess, something that the tackler can control because he the, can physically go lower. Well, he to can tackle. control his speed also. Yeah. So there's a, So all but of this like, is bound yeah. by technique, right? And yeah. we then. So then, having had that meeting, the next meeting we had was a meeting with the defence coaches from the top ten, so six nations and championship teams. So Nee Narber was there from South Africa, Sean Edwards from Wales, Andy Farrell from Ireland. So this was a pretty good mm. set of brains. And we said to them, right, like, it's clearly a technique issue mm. that's causing many of these head injuries. It's not just head on wrong side, it's alignment, it's tracking, it's feet planting, all this sort of stuff. So what do we do about it? And they gave us some suggestions. But, like, think, think about from World Rugby's perspective, how do we force technique? No. How do we force coaches to change technique? It's very difficult. You're but gonna have to start that at a very young age and kind yeah, of get it through. That's, so it's a whole new generation. So now it's the whole world. Yeah. And world rugby's got direct influence over only a very small percentage yeah. of world rugby players. So how okay, so ask, ask the question is how do we change the technique of players? And one way to try and do that is to punish what we've identified to be bad technique. But now you can't ask the referee to give a card to the oak who tackles badly. No. But what you can say is, right, bad technique is high contact, heads in airspace, when we want the tackler to be lower and bent. So therefore, let's be stricter on the current high tackle. Because if we can send a message to the player that he's got to get lower, yeah. instead of tackling the sternum or shoulder, because you want to try and dislodge mm. the ball and prevent yeah. the offload, we want you to tackle midway up just under the ribs or on the belly yeah. button, whatever it is. And so if you want to go high, like by all means, go for it, but you're running the risk of a oh. red or a yellow card. So the idea of sanction, penalty, yellow, red, was to try and drive a behavior that we thought would be safer. And that was why in 2017, there was a directive that basically said zero tolerance to head contact. Now, that's never, no. that's never theoretically possible because there's always going to be some head contact. But the, the concept was correct, is that we wanted to be harsher than ever on higher contact tackles so that we could tell players you've got to go lower and then that way you put the ball back in the court of the coach and he's going to start saying right we've got to teach our players to go lower and some coaches responded to that so Jock Ninabe was at Munster at the time and they started doing drills to teach the players how to be powerful low into contact and his own account is they significantly lowered the concussion numbers within okay. Munster so so we were encouraged by that and since that directive, many competitions have seen a drop in the concussion number. So we, we're pretty confident that that is the way to go. Yeah. But there have been, they've been issues around consistency, wrong decisions, controversial decisions, and so yeah. forth. So, so, so where we are now is trying to fix the consistency issue. Like two referees will see the same tackle. One will say play on, yeah. and the other one will give a yellow or a red card. You can't have no. that. It, one of those undermines the message. Yeah. And in my opinion, it's the one who says play on. I'd rather they gave... Rather do a yellow. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, like, just statistically, you, you watch a lot of rugby, like, and this is where I get sometimes irritated with fans because they're not, they're not always rational. And I understand that's cool. That's why sport is cool. But <laughs> <laughs> on this issue, like, I would like people to be a bit more thoughtful. Like, we complain about yellow cards killing the game. How many matches between high tackle yellow cards? Like yeah. we know, after the directive, 2017 and 2018, we've got the data on this, on average there's a yellow card every eight matches. So in other words, you will watch almost an entire weekend of Super Rugby and, one yellow and card. you might see one yellow card on average. Mm. One red card every 54 matches for a high tackle. So that means that you can watch six weeks of Super Rugby and you'll see one red card for a high tackle. That, that's not tackling in the air or fighting yeah, like Skulk and, and Funamava were. That's for high tackles. So, so this, this perception among the public that the yellow cards and the penalty, there's one high tackle penalty per match on average. Sometimes three, but three matches will have none. So but that one doesn't on average, make no. sense if you, sorry, if interrupting, but that doesn't make sense if you look at the concussion rate and how many players have concussions and then that's the only yellow card that you're getting. That kind of doesn't really... Well, which, which side of that's the problem? So the concussion side is the truth, right? Yes. 
The problem is that the high, high contact tackles are just not being penalised. So, no. So then the RFU guys in the PRL in England, they did some analysis and they reckon 40% of all tackles in rugby happen above the armpit line. The first contact with the ball carrier is above this so line. So 40% of tackles are actually illegal? Well, no, well, because armpit to shoulder is still legal. So like this is 15% and this is the other 30 odd, 35%. So that's how marginal the game is right now. And obviously, sure. sometimes the ball carrier bends into contact and then it's a legal tackle to hit yeah. him on the head because he's initiated he initiating. The, but the point, the point is that the, the perception that rugby is being too harsh on high tackles is not borne out by facts. There, there are, you, you are more likely to see a yellow card for a knock-on than a high tackle. That, to yeah. me, no. is untenable. You can't say that, that, that high tackles are ruining the game when a knock-on is more likely to see you leave the field. It's, it's ridiculous. No, that is ridiculous. So. Um, but I think also with the, the way the problem comes in, I think if I think of high tackles, I think of the tackle of CJ Stando and Pat Lambie. Yeah, that was a late hit and that a was a kick late, charge. Yeah, on a kick charge. Yeah. Um, I think that was in 2016, and that caused Pat to have to retire. Um, well, it was one of a early. handful of concussions, yeah. But then what also I think where the problem comes in is that World Rugby made a, like a very big drive into management of concussions after it happened. So sending you off the field, you can get 10 minutes off to do the concussion testing and then the management after that, but still nothing to really stop it. Yeah, so... And that's now... So the management drive, if I can give you a very quick history lesson. In 20, <laughs> 2011 World Cup in New Zealand, they, obviously doctors knew what concussion was and they were identifying it after the match. It turns out that 56% of players who were concussed on the field had stayed on the field. And they'd only 56 percent yes yeah, so that's more than one in two right Jeepers. because at that time there was no mechanism to evaluate the player yeah. and the other stats is so 56 percent is your one number and your other number is 64 seconds 64 seconds is the average length of time the doctor has from the time he runs onto the field till he has to leave so you're asking a doctor in front of 35,000 people a under pressure concussed. the player wants to stay on and he now has to make a, an assessment of whether this player is concussed or not. It's impossible. Really? So it's not surprising that 56% yes. of them. So what's the solution to that? The, the first thing is you have to buy the doctor time. And the second thing is you have to give him knowledge. Mm. And what should he be looking at to diagnose a concussion? And that's what the w head injury assessment, the HIA, was mm. designed to do. Initially, it was a five-minute pitch side concussion assessment that then grew to 10 minutes because it consists of a number of tests. There's a symptom check, there's a balance check, there's a memory, there's a cognitive function, there's an orientation and so forth. So now the doctor's got a toolkit and he's got the relative quiet of the yeah. changing room and all of a sudden far fewer players go back after concussion. It still happens, yeah. but that 56 is now seven. But also not just going back on the field, playing the next match again. I think that's yeah, also yeah, what so happened with Pat is because he played Super Rugby match a couple of weeks later and he never really recovered from his concussion from that. Yeah, so that was happening to all those players yes. at the time, is that there was no... So, so allied to the assessment was a general return to play protocol mm. where you have to go through five, six distinct stages before the seventh, which is play the match. And in the absence of that, it was a subjective yeah. call. How are you feeling today, Pat? Pretty uh, good, thanks, pretty good. coach. Big yeah. game on the weekend. Okay, you're up in 15. So that, that was happening all the mm. time. And there, there will be... And there have been cases where players have accused their clubs of forcing them back when they had brain injuries. Yeah. So that's, that was a big issue. So the first priority for World Rugby, 2011 onwards, was to fix the management. In other words, when it happens, how do we best care for the player and make sure that it doesn't make it worse? Yeah. By 2015, as I said, the, the number of players who return to field is now down to 7%. So it used to be 1 in 2, it's now 1 in 15 so, so that's mm. not perfect. I'd love it to be one in a hundred, but we yeah. get there. Now the priority becomes prevention. So now how can we stop them from happening? So this whole prevention thing is relatively recent. Yeah, yeah. So that's important to I think you mind. had a conference earlier this year in January where the NFL, like all the... Con um, yeah, and, and, gets, yeah. and as far as prevention goes, I think we are ahead of where they are. Oh, that's great. So they requested a know. meeting and they flew over to Paris and I flew up and few other people from World Rugby and we had a two day, two full day sit down in Paris to talk about what we were both doing. Mm. And I think in terms of using the law as a lever to change behavior, 
we are further advanced than they are. But we, we wouldn't have been there had we not spent a lot of time and energy trying to understand yeah. how do these things happen. So but now we have all of that. We have the management of the concussion. We have the kind of try to prevent it. But we still then have the person in charge of the game to really have all the tools that he needs to call the referee, to call is it a high tackle or not. Yeah. Um, like you said earlier, there are like two two um, referees will see something completely different. Um, if you look at that Owen Farrell tackle on Graham in, its, um, in Scotland, yeah, that game. That oh, the most recent one. The most recent one. Farrell's a, but Farrell's Farrell's a highlight reel of shoulder charges. Yeah, he's, yeah, but why has he never been sent off? Well, I think it's, it's, it comes back to what I said, is that define shoulder charge. So you know, when that happened, when the, when the one against us happened, I, I can't remember if I tweeted something or if I was just following it on Twitter. Yeah. But, but there were as many people saying it was a legitimate attempt to wrap the arms as it wasn't. Now, that was very polarized based on yeah. patriotic lines. All the English yeah. people said, what a great hit. And all the South African people said, send this man to prison. Yeah. <laughs> um, a neutral probably said it's a shoulder charge, yeah. right? So that's important. But the point is that no one has defined what it looks what like. So, so back to concussion. A player takes a knock to the head. You'll see where I'm going with this in a moment. And he, and he goes down on the floor and he lies still for two seconds. Is he concussed? Yes or no? Some doctors would say yes because he's clearly lost consciousness. Other doctors will say no, he just went down and it took him a couple seconds to get up and he's still fine. So now, how can two doctors, qualified experts, see the same thing and arrive at polar opposite conclusions? Yeah. That's what's happening with refereeing. Two experts are seeing the same thing and one says A and the other one says B. And with the doctors, until World Rugby provided them with a definition, what is a loss of consciousness? The player has to strike the ground unprotected and remain motionless for how many seconds? Three. Okay, now everyone's working from mm. the same script. Now a hundred doctors will see it and 90 of them will say yes, it's a, it's a concussion because there's a definition. Mm. So with high tackles and shoulder charges, referees will say there was no attempt to wrap the arm. That to me is meaningless because how do I, how how do do I see an attempt to wrap the arm? Yeah. It's, not an, it's not a visually recognizable yeah. action. If my arm is there, is it, is it my attempt? So, so that it had to be defined. And that's, I and think that's, that's the biggest are, problem is that yeah. they haven't really thought planned. about the definitions. Now, in many parts of the world, like if you are ever unlucky enough to end up in a hospital emergency room, the medical staff will triage you. And they will do that based on measurable things. If your blood pressure is a certain value, mm. if your pupils are dilated, if your ventilation is X, Y, Z, then they know, do this. Mm. So if X, do that. If Y, do that. That's how the whole world functions. But referee decision making hasn't gone the same way. And we can criticize rugby for not doing this yet, but like I watched football last night and there was a handball decision and everyone lost their minds but because oh, how could it, it's a 50-50, it's give a dog a choice of two bones again. Yeah. And so they got the same problem is they've not, they haven't defined what are the video signs, what are the observable characteristics of a handball versus not a handball. Until they fix that, it'll carry on. And it's the same for rugby. And I think also in my, from a, again, from a fan's perspective, I do not really want to see a red card being given in the first 10 minutes of a game um, because then you play 40 men on the field for the rest of the match. Yeah. Don't you think referees also have that problem where they weren't actually, they would be more inclined Definitely. to give a red card later Definitely. in the game than and early in the game? That's human nature, right? I wouldn't want to be that guy. No. Six Nations, England, Scotland, 15 minutes to go, scores are tied, and I'm going to send the guy off but the field. But are the referees going to also be penalised for doing something like well, that? Because they're, they're in charge of that game. They yeah, have clearly to they're audited based on it. And I know in sevens that their decisions around dangerous play is the number one KPI. And that's, that's no, it's not a coincidence that in sevens, high tackles and yellow cards and red cards are much more likely than in 15s. Mm. Because they've made it a culture among the refs that they're going to come down harder on them. In 15s, that hasn't quite happened, and mm. we need to keep pushing for it. As for whether, so, so the media doesn't help. No. Because when we, when we brought out the directive to um, be harsher on the high tackles, give more cards, the media basically carried the message that we were going to kill the game. Mm. 
Mm. And the referees are vic uh, not victims, but they're vulnerable to that messaging, and so now suddenly they become yeah. more cautious. And so what happened in England, where the media has the biggest influence, mm -hmm. is that the number of penalties went like nearly double, but the number of yellow cards was dropped. So now... So they're just trying to, like, let's just yeah, at least just, do just something. Right? But yeah. So they got themselves in this bizarre situation where after the directive, you were less likely to get a yellow card than before. But you were much more likely to get a penalty. So before, every sixth penalty would be a yellow card. Afterwards, it's every 24th one. So you've, you've basically made it much, much less likely yeah. that you'll be punished. Yeah. So why would players ever change their behavior yeah. if the punishment isn't severe enough? So in England, the concussion rates didn't drop. Only now have they started to come down. Whereas the rest of the world, they came down. They so came down. The, the referee's ability to implement the law is massive in terms of how you yeah. change the risk. And what we have to figure out, because you have to be sympathetic to the ref, right? Because he might see in a sequence of one minute, nine tackles. And they're all at high speed. And he's not just watching the contact, he's got to watch Everything what happens else. next. Is, it a, is the player held up? Is his knee down? Mm. Once a ruck is formed, where's the offside line? Who's entering how? There's so much going on. On that offside that line, just clarify that for me, because they, I know World Rugby rev, like revised it or just made it more clear now. Yeah, yeah. What is okay, after the? I think England lost to New Zealand last year. I think the score was like 16-15. Yeah. And then a kick was charged down, and then England scored. Yeah, I think but Shields the, scored a charge down yeah, kick, which was disallowed. Yeah. So what yeah. is the actual offside line? Oof, I, I like that. It's behind. It's it's, it's behind, behind the hindmost foot. No, it's behind the body part. It was the foot, I think. And now it's like behind so, the most like body part. And I don't really know how that so ma actually a, makes a difference. We need a law book to see. But what I can say is the law, they wouldn't have changed the law. They can't change a law they in a World Cup year anyway. No, they don't. So, so, so we'll, people say we tinker with the laws a lot, and which, is, which is true. Because the headline was... Um, will Dragby secretly change the offside law without no, telling no. So, anyone? <laughs> so, so what happens is they issue clarifications on existing law. Ah, okay. And that happens quite a lot. So every month there's a handful of requests goes mm. into World Rugby from different unions saying we just ah. want to understand the interpretation of this law. And then World Rugby's got a technical services department, which ah. is where I'm part of, but they also handle law issues. And then a clarification gets written about how you handle that particular law okay. and how you meant to interpret it. Because so now they're saying, no, it actually should have been a trial because he actually wasn't offside, if you clarify that law. But it's something yeah, it used the to be the hind foot and now it's the body part, but I don't really... No, I can assure you they didn't change the law. Okay. It, that'll just be a clarification of law and how it's interpreted. The, the law change happens once the World Cup's finished. There's a law review group. Yeah. which consists of coaches and high-performance people from each union. It's not a bunch of referees in suits, by the way. It's actually like, so Hansen sat on it, and Dave Rennie, oh, okay. uh, Nusa Fora from Ireland, Rob Andrew from England at that time. Uh, our guy who was there at various times was Sean Rue, was the assistant coach at that stage. And so it's coaches of teams that sit on the law group. Okay. Who then discuss whether laws need to be changed or not? But don't you think, just from very side, like if it's those teams like New Zealand and them playing, don't you think they kind of like change the law so it suits them? You, we know how New Zealand plays like right on that. Yeah, but everyone's right got the, the same say. So, okay. If New Zealand, if New Zealand send coaches there like Dave Rennie and Hansen, and they're better prepared than all the other coaches with a specific mandate to try and change the mall or the mm. ruck laws or whatever in a way that will favour them. And the other nine countries, in mm. fact, it's more than nine because Japan are on there and Fiji's on there and so forth. If they don't do the same thing, then they're just being outmaneuvered. Um, so. Yeah, and then also, where are these laws going to be trialed? The, the, especially like the, the high tech, the ones. new safety ones. So historically, once a law is submitted, and that's any, I remember going, because I'm on the law review group, mm. uh, because my job is to ask whether the law works or not, yes or no. And what, so what does a successful law look like? So if you have a law that's designed to reduce kicking, for argument's sake, then you have to measure, once it's applied, did it did achieve it its result, and what unintended consequences did it have? And that's my job, is to manage that research. Uh -uh. So I remember there were proposals from the Netherlands and Uruguay and Chile and whatever, and then obviously Australia, South Africa, Argentina, New Zealand, England, Wales, France. 
So that, that group of people is about 30 or so in total. They discuss it. Once they tentatively agree, it goes to trial. And then the way that it's worked in the past is that unions have to volunteer to trial them. Oh. And that's been a little bit of a sticking point because England might volunteer to trial it, but they don't want the premiership to do it. Yeah, they'll do it. And so they'll do it at a level down or the university. South Africa might say yes, and then it ends up in Varsity Cup. And the difference in coaching quality, yeah. player quality is pretty enormous. So sometimes you get an inaccurate picture of what it looked like. The ones that were discussed now in Paris, like the 5022, which mm. we'll come back to because we yeah. we're, we're going to come back to that. The, the intention then, and, and we, we think that we've got stakeholder buy-in, is like French rugby, England rugby, they want to trial it. Okay. And so then we're going to push hard that it get trialed in their, in their top level competitions. Okay. Because they've said to us in meetings that they are we do. committed and we're committed. So we just have to try and get everyone's buy-in. Like the rugby community, I think, understands this, the necessity of doing it mm. in, in these situations. Uh, in, in those level yeah, of competitions that, that label, for the yeah. sake of the global game. So that's the idea yeah. now is we leverage that and say, look, no more third tier competition. Yeah. Let's go straight in at the top and see what it does. So tell me about the 50-20 rule. So do, you remember, <laughs> so do you remember the spectrum of risk, the things that cause head injury? Yeah. And we had active shoulder, front on, upper, high, upright tackle, high contact. Yeah. The other two were speed and acceleration. So we say to those coaches, how do you take the speed and the acceleration out of the tackle? That's very difficult to do. Mm. But one of the contributing factors, especially in the modern game, is line speed and rush defense. So then you say, well, why, why is line speed such a priority now? Mm. You look at the Lions when they beat New Zealand and then drew the series down, down in New Zealand in 2017. Yeah. When you look at the way that England uh, almost beat New Zealand, the way that Ireland's done New Zealand twice now. Even us, when we beat New Zealand in Wellington and we should have beaten them in Pretoria, same story. The game is all about rush defense and putting pressure on the fly-half center. Yeah. The reason that's happened is because the ruck has gotten less contestable. Yes. So 10 years ago, when there was a tackle situation and the players went to ground, the tackler had an opportunity to play the ball. Yeah. And, and the arriving players could also try and get at the ball. And so you could either win the ball as a turnover or you could slow it down. And in response to that, you, you had three or four defensive players and the attacking team had to put four or five. So now you had seven players around the ball, mm -hmm. which means that you only had ten or so on each side on their feet. As they changed the laws to make it quicker ruck ball because they want the game to look faster, uh, they said that the tackler has to release, show, remember it was called the chicken wings, release, and then you had rights to play the ball, yeah? Then they made it that the tackler couldn't play it at all until he went until back he went through back the gate. Now that means he was basically out the game. Yeah. So the only way you could now win a turnover was the second arriving player could potentially yeah. jackal. But what, what defensive coaches worked out really quickly is that there's no, not that there's no benefit, but there's, there's unlikely to be benefit of putting three or four guys in that rack. So when you watch rugby matches now, what you'll see is that when there's a tackle situation, the tackler tries to get out as quick as possible. And if there's no one there to jackal, yeah. everyone gets out. Yeah. And you'll often have a situation where the, the defending team has got 15 guys on their feet. Now they drop one back to cover the kick, yeah. but you've got 14 in a line. Meanwhile, the t attacking team has to put two or three there to get the ruck ball back, and they've only got 12. So you've got 14 on 12. Now, the moment you're numbered up, you can rush. Yeah. And so, because the ruck is no longer as contestable, coaches have said, right, in that case, we're going to put pressure on the next thing. And what's the next thing? The pass. The pass, yeah. So now we're flying into contact. So the mindset became, let's just get up as quick as possible, rush defense, at the expense of integrity and at the expense of technique. So players have sacrificed tackle technique in order to be it's faster. Really faster. It's, a, it's basically a question of hit the guy as he gets the ball. doesn't matter whether you're in the right position or on the wrong foot or not, just knock that your alignment's yeah. not, just make sure you're there. Yeah. Put pressure on the next thing. You know, one of the coaches in Paris said to me, the ruck is now in the air. Like that's where, you wanna, that's where you're gonna win yeah. the ball, is on the hit. So if line speed then is the thing driving the risk, yeah. how do you take line speed away? Now, if you go back to first principles, Line speed happens because you're numbered up. Yeah. If, if a defense ever gets into a situation where it's four on six, 
four defenders, six attackers, or even five, yeah. they won't rush because you just give them one, hands, 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 try. Yeah. What they do instead is then drift. So line speed is all about numbers. Oh, okay. So the point of the 50-22 is to compel the defending team to drop two players back because now they've got to cover a kick there and, and a kick, a kick the there. Side. Because the consequence of a kick that goes out is that the other team's going to get the line out. So the moment that team has to drop two players back, they're less likely oh, to rush. Okay. And so the, the whole point of the 50-22 is not to create space and it's not to give the attacking team time. It's literally to, to negate rush defense. That's why it's a safety law. Okay. It, might, it might also give Bowden Barrett more time because now instead of having six Englishmen or South Running African charging at him, he's only got four. And if he can step one, he's got two meters of space more to work with than before. That's cool. But the main thing was to take the speed out of the rush. Okay. Yeah. And that will obviously also make the game a bit more faster, I guess. Yeah, which in itself yeah. might increase the risk of injury. So yeah. in sevens, the risk of injury is much higher than 15. Yeah. Because the collisions are higher speed. People are freaking out. Like I've seen a lot of people say, oh, now they'll just kick all the time. But the thing is, you wouldn't. Because if... If you're playing New Zealand and you're Pollard and you've got Rico Ayani on, one, on, the, on the right wing yeah. dropping back or left wing and Ben Smith's on the other side yeah, you don't want to and kick. you mess that kick up and you kick it straight into his hands, now you've got a big problem. Yeah. So I, don't, so I, think, that, I think that good fly halves will, will become even more valuable because... Be really skillful and tactical kicks yeah, that they yeah, will and be the, giving. Yeah, and, the, and the, the need to kick well, this, will be greater. Please, please, please stop the freaking box kick. Or not? Um, I don't know. Like, because when we discussed it in Paris, it was meant to be a 50-22. So, yeah. in other words, if you were in your own half, you could kick into their 22. And it was also meant to be a 22-50, where if you were in your own 22, you, you could kick, kick into, into their, their half. Since then, I've only ever seen it called a 50-22. So I'm not sure whether that's gotten yeah. lost in translation. Yeah. If it's a 22-50, then I think it would replace some box kicking. Oh, because so. at the moment, the box kick is a pressure-relieving option. Yeah. They put nine guys in the ruck. They make a wall of protection. And, they and then they kick around. what's meant to be a contestable kick. Yeah. If you give them a 22-50 option and they can kick it out, then they'll use that half the time. Yeah. Is that better or worse? I don't know. You don't really know. Yeah. And then, just because you also, you were very involved in the, um, what's it, the Nations Cup or the Nations Champs. That they that World Rugby is proposing now. Yeah, I think not, not involved. I mean, that's that's above my pay well, grade. Not that's involved. The pro that's politicians. But <laughs> weren't you um, part of a little bit of the travelling and yeah. figuring out how much more they're going to travel and how that's going to affect? Yeah. So, despite what was reported in the media, World Rugby is very serious about considering player welfare. So when they proposed a new structure for the global calendar, mm. the questions were like, does it increase the demands on the player? And the answer was, it didn't mean more matches. No, so they, they it was kept actually a, less matches. So like a Andy, uh, Owen Farrell or Pollard or Khaleesi or whoever, um, Barrett, they're going to play 13, 12, maybe I think between 12 and 14 which matches. Which is the same it's now the same. as it would be in the future. So yeah. that, one, that bit was dealt with. The change was going to be that England would potentially have to go in June, July, instead of just coming here for three games like they did last year, they might have to come here and then New Zealand, uh, sorry, Argentina and New Zealand. So that's a lot of travel. Yeah. And so we were consulted about whether that would make the make or break the situation. Is it a yes or a no for you on the on the new format? I th I think it would be cool. I think it would it would if only because it would invite Fiji and Japan initially mm. and then potentially in the future Georgia, USA, Germany is potentially a hotbed. Oh, really? Samoa, whoever it is that comes yeah. forward to get a share of the pie because I think what rugby people have to ask themselves is like in 2038, mm. you know, 19, 20 years from now, what does the World Cup look like? Yeah. Is it going to be the same eight teams? Same, yeah, top 10. Going teams. for, like we know more or less who's the, who the quarterfinals are going to be yeah. in Japan. We hope that Fiji are good enough to scare Wales and maybe beat Australia. That would be wonderful yeah. to see Fiji there. We don't think Japan will be good enough to beat Scotland and Ireland. Yeah. So who else is there from the second tier who's going to make a quarter? That's in the a couple same of years, was, that's USA the same will as definitely be. It was 12 be. years ago. Yeah. And maybe USA will get to that point yeah. and then they'll plateau. So 
what will it take for those countries to make the next step up? Mm. That's what this concept was designed to do. So I feel sympathetic to World Rugby because they, they're legitimately trying it for good reasons. Everyone's like, oh, they're just going to make more money off it and so on. Not really. Like, mm. World Rugby doesn't make money off Six Nations and whatnot and stuff. Anyway, those tournaments make money for Six Nations or Championship. But what it would do is it would give us, the Southern Hemisphere, mm. South Africa in, and Australia especially, where the game really is struggling financially, yeah. an opportunity to get a bigger piggy bank and to be part of like the, the growth of Northern Hemisphere. It would just tie everything together and it would offer those Tier 2 nations a viable mm. shot at playing more top quality games. So, like, so I think if the game's going to look different in 20 years' time at the 2039 World Cup, this thing needs, this to, happen. needs to happen. But, but the problem is that, and I guess it's understandable, is that the politicians and the business people who make the decisions, they've got to vote. So uh, England's got to vote, Wales has got to vote, Italy, France, New Zealand, Australia. Mm. Now I think we'll all vote for it because we need it. They'll but say we don't need this. Yeah. And there's a risk here because if England gets relegated, then they're What's not in the Six Nations. Six nations? Yeah. They lose the TV deal. And suddenly the whole game, even community, yeah. because they use that money to fund or that's a big now on New Zealand are England gonna be relegated from the Six Nations? No. No. Nah. And are there ways around that? Like you could offer these parachute payments where for the first year out you still get the money. You would have gotten it. Because England were. even if they got relegated, they'd come up the next year, surely. But definitely, yeah. So can you offer them some insurance? Maybe that, that would be the way around that. So I I would, I would like to think that they will vote for the interest of the global game, but why, sh why should yeah. they? Like, why does Italy care about the game in Fiji? Yeah. They don't. So that's the problem that World Rugby's got, is that they are, like there's that saying, you want turkeys to vote for Christmas. Like, no one's going to do that. <laughs> but I would hope that they do, because they see that Christmas yeah, they would actually be better the... if they voted for it. Yeah. Anyway, so. Okay. Well, no. I, th I learned a lot more today. But before we actually say <laughs> goodbye, there's one um, argument that I would want you to settle for me, please. Mbolelo and I have this very yeah. big argument that um, Eben Etzebeth should not, I say, should be involved in the Springbok squad, and Mbolelo says no. What is your view on Eben? I haven't seen the, I've been overseas a lot, and I haven't seen much of the Stormers playing, and he hasn't played much, to be fair. Mm. Um, I think if you ask New Zealand, if you ask Retallick and Whitelock which South African lock they would rather not face, they would say him. So basically he should be playing. Okay, I so unless he's, <laughs> unless he's horribly out of form and you have very clear options in the form of Diaga and Snayman and so on, but you don't because they're injured, Yeah. like who do you replace him with? And is that replacement going to add the same impact impact as he's and as he's going to add and and the thing about it is like we don't know what the coach wants him to do mm. like so you know victor matfield when he was a lock he was in the team for one reason and that was to win lineouts and analyze the opposition and steal lineouts he wasn't there to make carries and dominate mm. collisions and so forth whereas when you look so, so that was a different yeah. kpis it's, it's a different set of evaluation yeah. criteria for a lock if you ask the same thing of England, Alan Wynne Jones is doing different things to Matfield and probably to Etzebeth. He's maybe the best lock in the world now. Retallick is on the wing scoring tries. Etzebeth on the wing is a, something's gone wrong with yeah. the system. So the coach, the coach will have certain requirements, and this is spectator fans must understand this all the time: is that we we judge them based on our expectations of what they should do, mm. and the coach might be saying actually he's doing a really good job, even though we don't think he is. So. Anyway, I'm fudging my answer. <laughs> the answer is that if he's been your best luck for five or six years and you're going into a World Cup and we know that experience matters in a World Cup more than like flash ability and you know that New Zealand, Australia, England mm. and so forth will be a little bit fearful of the physical presence that he adds to the team yeah. and you take that out and you create like a highway for Retallick and their big ball carriers yeah. to go through, then you lose. So you have to pick the guy. Yay, I win. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. And it was so nice having you here. Sure. Thank you Thanks. for your insights. Yes. Um, Sorry for the medical talk. <laughs> we didn't get much rugby in there, but... We can have a next one. We can talk just rugby. Sure. Great. No okay. And um, thank you very much for listening and good night. <laughs>